All right, 1 Chronicles chapter 12. Now, I don't know how this message is going to work out today because this is really what I wanted to preach last Sunday. And I have preached on this theme before, but not in the way we're going to deal with it today. And it's a, a message that I think is extremely important for the day and hour in which we live. By the way, every message is important for the day and hour in which we live. Amen? I mean, it's always applicable in some way because the Word of God is alive and it's never changing and it's always concrete and objective, uh, objective truth. And so everything I'm about to tell you this morning has application to you today, but, but even more application than really ever before. All right? Let me just go ahead and be the pastor to emphasize that this message has absolute major importance for us. Amen. We've got two and a half years left on the lease on this building. That gives us two and a half years, that gives us two and a half years to find another location. Yeah. A bigger location. One that we can spread our legs and allow the kids to run on 50 acres and a mule, you know? <laughs> Just let them go, you know? We're having problems because we have so many kids. And by the way, there's not a problem with having so many kids. I like having a lot of kids. In fact, a few weeks ago, uh, Brother Hamersky, who's not here this morning, the elder Hamersky, uh, we, it was a Wednesday night, and uh, he came in, and I, I stood by him and looked up to him and said, uh, <laughs> Brother Hamersky, Yes. Brother Hamersky, just listen. He says, what are we listening to? I says, just listen to those kids, James in particular. Just listen to those kids. I says, that is the future of Freedom's Way. I says, when you walk into a church building and you don't hear that, there's no life. And I praise the Lord for the, the children's ministry and I praise the Lord for our kids, and I praise the Lord for families that are doing their best to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And we want to make sure that there is a, a fellowship that continues after this, because, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm 40, and some of you guys are a little longer in the tooth. We're not going to be here forever, but we need to, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to continue, especially here in Santa Clarita. It is within that spirit that I preach this message. Now, these are they that came to David to Ziklag. Boy, there's a place to reside, right? While he yet kept himself close because of Saul, the son of Kish, and they were among the mighty men, helpers of the war. So let me just give you context very briefly. Saul obviously is jealous over David. And Saul came in from battle, and all of a sudden he thought that he would all the accolades and all of the, uh, all of the praise should have been heaped upon Saul. But the ladies were singing and dancing a jig and saying, Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his tens of thousands. And Saul from that very moment began to breathe threatenings against David and sought to take his life because he believed that David was going to wrestle the kingdom away from Saul. By the way... God gave Saul the kingdom, and only God could take the kingdom away. Amen. David wasn't going to wrestle anything away, uh, but the fact is God already had his plan in play. So this is what is happening here. That's why it says that David went to Zip, Ziklag, and while he kept himself close because of Saul, the son of Kish, that's why he kept close to that place. And the Bible says they were among the mighty men, helpers of the war. Look at verse 2. They were armed with bows and could use both the right hand and the left in hurling stones and shooting arrows out of a bow, even of Saul's brethren of Benjamin. And then from verse 3 on, you have a list of some of these, or if not all of these mighty men, and some of their accolades. Talks about in verse number 8, and the Gadites there separated themselves unto David into the hold of the wilderness, men of might and men of war fit for the battle that could handle shield and buckler whose faces were like the faces of lions and were as swift as the rose upon the mountains. And then it goes on to name a few of those in verses 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. And then it goes on to talk about uh, some other things there in verse 15. And then in verse 23, 
It talks about these are the numbers of the bands that were ready, armed to the war, and came to David to Hebron, which, by the way, which is where David would be ultimately crowned king, to turn the kingdom of Saul to him according to the word of the Lord. So here they end up going to, to Hebron, where ultimately David is going to be anointed king by the Lord Jesus Christ, by God himself. And then the Bible says in verse number 33, we're going to kind of pick up the narrative at verse 33, of Zebulon, such as went forth to battle, expert in war, with all instruments of war, 50,000, which could keep rank, they were not of double heart. And of Naphtali, a thousand captains, and with them with shield and spear, 30 and 7,000. And of the Danites, expert in war, 20 and 8,600. And of Asher, such as went forth, to, oh, Asher, such as went forth to battle, expert in war, 40,000. And on the other side of Jordan, of the Reubenites and of the Gadites and of the half tribe of Manasseh, with all manner of instruments of war for the battle, 120,000. Verse 38. All these men of war that we just read through that could keep rank came with a perfect heart to Hebron to make David king over all Israel and all the rest also of Israel were of one heart to make David king. Say amen. amen. The God that we serve is a God of order, He is a God of structure, and He is a God of discipline. Amen. Order, structure, and discipline are three things that you and I in the army of God need, but they're also three things that we often lack. See, not only in our normal day-to-day -day life, but more importantly, in our walk with Christ, which should be daily. And it is my contention this morning that in order for this church body to move into the next phase of whatever God has for us, with a bold vision connected with it and a fervent heart for the Lord, then we must become very proficient at keeping rank. Amen. There is nothing more awesome and awe-inspiring than to see the church of the living God both on fire, which is what we need, and walking in lockstep to God's word and God's way doing it His way, the way He put it down, and listening to the men of God that He has placed in charge over the captains of hundreds and thousands, Amen. and walking in lockstep, shoulder to shoulder, toe to heel, yeah. forward, keeping rank. Yeah. This morning, the title of the message is simply, Keeping Rank. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to look to your word. Father, I just pray this morning that you would allow me, Lord, to just be able to lay out everything that you've got all in my heart, Lord, about this message. And Father, I've got pen marks here and there on this message, Father, and I've added some things, Lord, and I believe that you've allowed me to add those things, Father. And I pray that they, those additions would be helpful. Help me to clarify, Lord. I pray the Holy Spirit of God would have free course in this service, Lord, to speak to the individual hearts. And then, Father, that we may collectively walk out of here knowing that it is our duty, it is our fundamental duty to keep rank. And, Father, I pray this morning that you would touch our hearts. And, Father, knit us together on fire for you with one purpose and one cause in mind. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want you to notice that you've, if you've ever read your Bible, and I hope you've read it at least through more than one time, I always tell people, uh, students at the Bible college, say, Pastor, when you read your Bible through, what do you do after that? I read it again. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. What do you do when you read it a second time? I just read it again. Yeah. What do you do about a third? I just read it again. You just keep reading it again. You know, I just read it again and again and again. You always find something in it. 
uh, that uh, is new and uh, something that you missed. And I, I've preached a message on keeping rank in the past. In fact, I preached in December of 2011. Uh, but I, I, I wanted to make sure that that message wasn't getting repeated. So the Lord gave me some extra things that hopefully will uh, allow us to keep focus for the next two and a half years on doing exactly that, and that is keeping rank. But if you've read through your Bible at all, you'll notice that it is not devoid of military terms. I mean, from Genesis all the way to Revelation, even our God, who is a consuming fire, is called in the book of Deuteronomy a man of war, and he is also coming back on a white steed, and he's going to do battle with a sword that proceeds out of his mouth, and we're going to look and not even break a sweat. And, and I'm telling you, all through the Word of God, you're going to see all kinds of military engagements, and you're going to see military terms, and you're going to see how our writer in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, uses all kinds of stuff like endure hardness as a good soldier, run the race, and all this kinds of stuff that kind of point to this military terminology in the Word of God. It's all intricately intertwined. But I want to describe very briefly what it means to keep rank, and I hate to use a visual illustration, but on the other hand, this is probably the best way to do it. You've all seen movies where soldiers are standing soldier to soldier and toe to heel to the person in front of them. And they're literally walking in lockstep, keeping rank. No one is breaking rank because that would be a problem. The whole point of keeping rank is making sure that you have your formation tight and moving forward. If you will, shoulder to shoulder, toe to heel, walking in an unbroken assembly of single-hearted, one mind and one mission kind of people. Now, let me just, w w without getting into the rest of the message here and, and, and messing up a few other key points, if we're walking in an unbroken assembly of single-hearted, one mind and one mission individuals, then that means that His mission must be our mission. In other words, if we're keeping rank, the only way we can keep rank is, is if we're trying to do the will of the commander-in-chief. And, and as soon as someone does break rank, it's because someone is listening to somebody else other than the commander-in-chief. Right. So keeping rank is a military term, it's a strategic term, and it's an absolute essential in battle. Yep. It defines both sides as well. And by the way, it's, it's a commentary on how tight you keep rank on your commander. They all wanted to be in Patton's army, but at the same time, they all wanted out of Patton's army. Right? Yeah, we, we want to be a commander uh, under co Commander Patton. But then when they got there, we don't want to be under this guy. Why? Discipline. It's no different with the Lord. We all want to enlist, as we talked about last Sunday. But when we find out about the stakes, we're like, I don't know if I signed up for all this. But keeping rank is a military term. And the scriptures are replete with these military terms when speaking of our walk with the Lord and our battle with the enemy. Now, I want you to notice something about keeping rank very briefly before we uh, get into a thing or two about the message. Who are these men that went unto David in Ziklag, who then followed him to Hebron to then usher him into kingdom. Look at 1 Samuel. Keep your finger in 1 Chronicles. Look at 1 Samuel. Keep your finger there in 1 Chronicles, if you would. 1 Samuel chapter 22. And I want you to notice this. 1 Samuel chapter 22. This is the theme, really, of our Mighty Men's Fellowship that we have every other month here at Freedom's Way Baptist Church. 1 Samuel chapter 22 and verse number 1. Now remember, this is after. We're picking up the narrative right where 1 Chronicles is. David and Saul, there's some... Saul's breathing threatenings against David and all this kind of stuff, thinking that David's going to wrestle the kingdom away from him. Chapter 22 of 1 Samuel, verse 1 says, David therefore departed thence 
and escaped to the cave of Dullam. Okay? And when his brethren and all of his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. So when they heard that David went down to the cave of Dullam to escape, they all followed him there. And in verse 2 it says, And everyone that was in distress, and everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented, gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them, and there were with him about 400 men. That is a wonderful illustration of the church of God. You say, who is a part of the freedom's way? People that are discontented, people that are in distress, and people that are in debt. You say, I'm not in debt, I don't have a credit card debt, but you're in debt to the Creator. That's you. And you gather around the captain. Because he's the guy that has the answers to your discontentment and your debt and your discouragement. And sometimes you have to gather with them in a lonely place, like a cave. To some, this just might be a cave. (laughs) Well, you go over the Freedom's Way, huh? Oh, okay. Is that the, that the strip mall over there? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we go to Grace. I'm not disparaging that. I'd love to trade properties with them as long as I get the right theology, but everything's fine. I love, I love the campus of Grace Baptist. You say, why? It reminds me of being in the middle of the Sierra Nevadas for some reason. All those conifers there and the little bridge over the river Kwai that I'd like to blow up and all that kind of stuff and the water and and the little sitting area and the little fireplace I love it there's nothing more that my flesh craves than to see that and say I belong there but I want you to know that these were men that were not happy-go-lucky everything was perfect these were discontented discouraged in debt men and David allowed them to gravitate towards him now I want you to go back to first Chronicles chapter 12 and I want to pick up and show you a few things about keeping rank this morning keeping rank has to do with being single-hearted keeping rank has to do with being single-hearted. Look at verse number 33 of chapter 12 of 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 33, the Bible says, Of Zebulon, such as went forth to battle, expert in war, with all instruments of war, 50,000 which could keep rank, they were not of double heart. If you will, the whole point of keeping rank is to do just that. Keep rank. Keep it tight. Keep it forward momentum. Make sure nobody breaks to the right or to the left. Make sure you're straight. Make sure your toe hits the guy in front of you's heel and your shoulders with the guy to your right and your left and you're moving forward. Keep rank. And don't be double-hearted. Be single-hearted. If you will, there is no room in God's army for misplaced affection or fence-sitting. You're either in this thing to win it or you're not. There is no room for, huh, I, I wonder what I could do if I didn't do this and did this. There's no dual affections in God's army. No dual affections. You don't need to turn there, but 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul is talking about the end of his ministry here, and he says this after he talks about he fought a good fight. He fought and finished his course. He kept his faith. After he says that there is a crown laid up for him, uh, but not for him only, but unto all them that love his appearing. After he says all of that, he says, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. Here you got a guy 
that enlisted, that got in the war, and probably rolled up his sleeves and did some things with Paul because he's mentioned in a couple of other passages. Demas obviously did some things ministerially with Paul and was probably in the, in the, in the brunt of the battle, was in some of those dugouts and probably thinking, yeah, I'm going to go all the way with Paul. But the problem is, when you're keeping rank shoulder to shoulder and, and toe to heel with the person in front of you, you don't have to turn your head to not have misplaced affections so long as your heart turns. That's right. Amen. I think of the Israelites in the book of Numbers. You don't need to turn there either. The book of Numbers, they're in the wilderness. And all of a sudden, they get upset because God's giving them food called manna. Oh, my goodness. Can you imagine? They're upset at God's provision. Bunch of whiny crybabies that some of you are too. Oh, man, God, I've had enough of this manna. I'd like to go to a hometown Christian buffet and pick my own stuff. I want fish sticks today. No, you're getting quail. But, but the Bible says this in verse 4 uh, of chapter 11. It says, And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, and the onions and the garlic, but now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. Oh, my goodness. Let me tell you what was happening. They were keeping rank. They may have looked like they were marching forward into Zion. It may have looked like they were shoulder to shoulder with the person to their right and to their left, and they were toe to heel to the person in front of them, and they were not breaking rank, but their heart was still in Egypt. In other words... You and I may look like we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, but our heart is drawing us away. Let me ask you a question, and just a silly question. What has the world ever given you of any lasting anything? What has the world given you? I mean, I like to decry the, the, the billboards because they're always half-truths, right? You know, uh, years ago, it was a, a big deal to be the Marlboro Man. Yeah. You know, now we got those commercials with the guys that are dying of cancer. Well, at, le at least that's the way they should have had it, you know. Here's the Marlboro, here's how you start off, this is how you end. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it's, it's, it's wonderful how all this stuff is, the marketing for it. But let me just say something to you. All I'm saying is this, you can look like you're in God's army, you can look like you're keeping rank, you can look like you're in formation, you can look like you're tight and you're wound up for the battle, but your heart is saying, boy, those leeks and melons, I sure miss them. Boy, I sure miss them. Boy, it was really good back there in Egypt. And it won't be long that when the heart begins to turn, then the formation begins to break. Keeping rank has to do with being single-hearted. There is no room for misplaced affection or fence sitting in the army of God. There are no dual affections. We need to be single-hearted knowing that there is an objective, and that is to get to Hebron and crown him king. Amen. Secondly, not only does keeping rank have to do with being single-hearted, but secondly, keeping rank has to do with differing skill levels. I want you to go back to 1 Chronicles chapter 12. 1 Chronicles chapter 12, look at verse number 2. So these mighty men gather themselves unto David at Ziklag. And in verse number 2 of, second, uh, of First Chronicles, excuse me, First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 2, it says, They were armed with bows and could use both the right hand and the left in hurling stones and shooting arrows out of a bow, even of Saul's brethren of Benjamin. Look at verses 33 and following of the same chapter. Of Zebulon, such as went forth to battle, expert in war, with all instruments of war, 50,000 which could keep rank. They were not of double heart. Look over to verse number 34. And of Naphtali, a thousand captains, and with them with shield and spear, thirty and seven thousand. Let me say something to you. Not everyone had the same skill level. Listen, you might be in God's army, 
But that doesn't mean we're all on the same level when it comes to skill. See, some could handle shields and spears. Others could handle bow and arrow. And some were stone slingers, both right-handed ones and left-handed ones. Some were captains, some were experts in war, some were young, some were old, yet whatever their differences were, when it came to their skill set, they, were, they could all do one thing, they could keep rank. It didn't matter where I was placed in this thing, so long as I did what my skill set required of God for me to do, and I could keep rank. Amen. Let me give, you, give me a passage on that, Hebrews chapter 5, look at Hebrews chapter 5 very briefly, just to give you a... A, a New Testament uh, illustration on that. Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 12. Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 12. The Bible says this. Hebrews 5, verse 12. For when for the time you ought to be teachers. By the way, verse 12 is a chastisement, so don't think that I'm uh, trying to apply verse 12 specifically. But for when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful. He is not talking about vitamin D. He's not talking about that which comes from the cow's udder. He is talking about the word. For everyone that, is, uh, is, that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat, if you will, 22-ounce ribeye, bone-in, rare, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, Bob, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You say, what am I saying? I'm saying that there are some guys in the rank that are milk guys. And unfortunately, no matter how much you try to encourage them, they kind of stay there for a long time. They're all about the Google Gaga ABCs of the Bible. And that's where they want to stay. Yep. So they'll watch Osteen. <laughs> I don't, like Pastor Dan said. Pastor Dan says, I don't like to talk about this. I love talking about those guys. <laughs> Leave that one to me, brother. <laughs> but listen, some people are into milk, and that's all the skill level that God is going to give them. And guess what? You can still use those guys. If anything, you may not necessarily place them in a classroom, you may not necessarily put them in a ministry position, but they can grab a sword and they can grab a shield and they can keep rank. And then you've got guys that uh, are skillful in the Word of God and they're of full age and they've got some meat. So instead of talking about the ABCs, they talk about, well, you know, uh, how the pyramid was built by the sons of gods. You know, things like that that none of you want to talk about. I'm not necessarily saying that's true. I'm just simply saying that that's the kind of conversations that they want to have. They're not going to talk about sanctification and justification because they've already got that straightened out. They've already got what Romans 3.10 means and Romans 3.23. They know what John 3.16 says. They know all about that. Now we're going to get into some deeper things, stuff that we can sink our teeth into. Why? Because the deeper you get into God's Word, the more marbleizing and caramelizing there is. Oh, man, it gets meaty in there, baby. It, and, it, and by the way, it's so easy to cut, a butter knife can do it. Yep. You know a good steak when you can take a butter knife to it. But listen, it didn't matter what their skill set was, so long as they could keep rank. Thirdly, keeping rank involves rallying around a leader. I don't want you to get all prideful here and think that, oh, preacher, you're going to insert yourself into this. Look at verse 38. 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 38. And all these men of war that could keep rank came with a perfect heart. It wasn't double-tongued. It wasn't double-hearted. They came with a perfect heart to Hebron with one objective in mind, to make David king over all Israel and all the rest also of Israel were of one heart to make David king. King. Amen. Keeping rank involves rallying around not only a leader, but a cause. See, while I might not be your under shepherd, while I might be your under shepherd, excuse me, the Lord Jesus Christ is our great shepherd. It is Jesus Christ who is and should be the king to whom we rally around, but there's got to be a captain over a hundred that keeps everybody in rank to do that. Amen. 
There's got to be someone that says, hey, hey, it doesn't matter. Hey, get your heart back in order. Get lockstep. Don't worry about the melons. Don't worry about the onions. Don't worry about the garland. Don't worry about the world. Get in lockstep. Let's keep right because we have someone to anoint king. We've got to rally around that leader. We've got to rally around a cause. And may I say sometimes, look at verse 38, all these men of war, they were all men of war. You say, what, what was that implying? They all knew what their purpose was and they weren't having any animus towards the one being king. Well, you know, I can... I could do the slingshot with my right hand and left hand. So maybe I should be king. Well, you know, I can do the slingshot with my right hand and left hand, and I can do the bow, and I can handle the sword, and I can handle the shield, and I can keep rank. None of that was even happening. It just says all these men of war. In other words, whatever their skill set was, they were proud to be doing what they were called to do that could keep rank because there was an agenda, there was a purpose, and that was to anoint David king. Amen. You can't see that unless you keep rank. Amen. That is unless he's not your king. If he's not your king, then you're not even in the ranks. And you're out over here. And if you get in the way of those that are keeping rank, you'll get stepped on. I don't have time to prove that. That's over in Hebrews 10, but we'll deal with that another day. Let me give you the, the fourth thing very briefly. Keeping rank implies discipline, focus. See, everything was good until I got to this last point. Because discipline means I've got to do something. I've got to force, I have got to wrestle myself in control to do something. Look at verse number 33 and verses 38 of First Chronicles 12. Verse 33 says, Of Zebulun, such as went forth to battle, expert in war, with all instruments of war, 50,000, underline the next two words, which could, which could. The implication is not everybody could. It, can, it, can we not just add the, the little bit of po little poetic license here? The implication is that perhaps maybe some couldn't. Yeah. Uh, let's go over to verse number 38. All these men of war that could, that could keep rank. Twice. The scripture states in the passage which either could or that could keep rank. Now let me, let me say something to you. Not everyone is sufficiently disciplined to keep rank. Why? Well, as we stated earlier, it all boils down to the condition of your heart. You may look like you're a soldier of God. You may look like you've got the shield, you've got the sword, you've got the armaments. You are walking in lockstep with the king's army but your heart is over here with the leeks and melons. You're Demas. You have forsaken me loving this present world. It implies discipline. Let me show you one last thing. Go back to Hebrews 5. Hebrews 5. We just read that a minute ago, but I want to notice something else about that passage. Hebrews chapter 5. Verse number... 12 through 14 again, for when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Look at verse 14. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. Now look at this last phrase. Even those who by reason of you, stop, 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 stop. The use of what? The use of that strong meat. Look up here. The constant 
feeding in this book. Amen. The constant feeding, if you will, belongs to them that are full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. This book is good for you. <laughs> and if you constantly exercise yourself in it, and it exercises its way through you, it will allow you to have discernment. See, the whole world is talking about fairness for transgendered. The whole world is talking about We've got to do this and we've got to do that. And we look at them like they're nuts. And they look at us in turn like we're nuts. But somebody has their face being exercised while the other one is going with a prevailing wind. Some of you can't effectively keep rank because you're not reading the battle plan. You're not reading it enough. You say, oh, I'm reading it a lot, preacher. You might be reading like you're reading a Stephen King novel, but are you meditating on it? Are you ruminating on it? Are you reading a verse and saying, all right, Lord, smack me with it? Yeah. Listen, I've been, in that, I've been in that position even as a pastor where I've got to get through my two chapters a day just, just so I can say I did it. Somebody say amen, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Sit there and act like you're all cavalier about it. I've never done that, preacher, never in my life. No, 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 never. No, I've done that where I'm reading my chapter or two. Oh, I've done my chapter. And I've read, I've read it, but I got nothing. But I read it. <laughs> and let me say something to you folks. You've got to have your senses exercised and discerned by reading this book. And that will allow discipline to then be engaged in your life so you can do some things in rank. But not everyone is sufficiently disciplined there. Why? Because they haven't had their senses exercised. Now, here's another thing about the word exercise that I hate. It implies physical exertion. I'm all about... Listen, I, I like to run. I have these little moments of, like, i got to run for a little bit. And then I get into like these seasons where I'm at right now because I could tell I'm in that season because the bu button was a little bit tougher this morning. I get in these seasons where I'm not going to run. I'm lazy. And then you're like lethargic. Like why am I tired at five in the evening? <laughs> I haven't even eaten anything yet. Well, I've eaten all kinds of things. I just haven't had my main meal yet. But I, why am I tired? What, how come this is ha Listen. When you don't do some things with your body, your body says you need to do some things. It, it, it screams you and says, you need to do something about this. And if your body doesn't scream, then your wife will. <laughs> but she's stuck with me. I don't have to have the abs anymore. have to. don't have to have the wavy hair that I had years ago. <laughs> Double amen. Hallelujah, Bob. Amen. don't have to. No. don't have to anymore. I have landed the fish. No, we really do have to be careful. Uh, we do. I mean, I'm... I'm, I'm uh, there it goes right there. But uh, we have to be careful. And, and, and I have to be careful. But let me say something to you. When you haven't read this book and you haven't exercised in it daily, you'll notice in day-to-day -day conversations that it's been a time since you've been in it. And when you haven't been in it for a long time and then you get into it real vigorously, it's sore. It's like, you know, not running for a four or five weeks and then running. And then the next morning you're like, oh, I'm never doing that again. I cannot get out of bed. 
That's what God's world do. It exercises your senses. You say, what's the point of that? So you can keep rank. So you can keep rank. You say, well, well what happens when someone breaks rank, preacher? That means somebody hasn't been exercising and someone's reflecting back on the world. Do you know what this church needs? Men and women who know how to keep rank. Because not everybody in this church knows how. And as we've witnessed just this year, some families just couldn't keep rank. Do you know what is happening as I preach this message? Some of you are marching to your own tune and have set your own heart upon another king. See, if we're keeping rank, we've got one king in mind. We're marching to Zion. And we're going to anoint him king. But somewhere along the way, the devil shows up and says, I got another king and another kingdom for you. And you are under the misguided impression that your breaking rank does not affect the whole of the rank. Let me say something to you. One defection breaks the entire rank. But let me tell you what will happen sometimes if that one defects or gets shot by an arrow. Others in rank will fill that spot and just keep moving. You say, why? Can't wait for someone to get back in. You're, you're going to have to get repaired. <laughs> you're going to have to either get repaired and get counsel back here with the commander and the captains and the generals and try to get back in rank, but we've got to keep moving. We've got to keep moving. See, keeping rank involves good order. It involves obedience to others. It involves teamwork. It involves discipline as well as unity and cohesion for the message. Amen. How about it? If you're in the ranks, keep it. If you're in the ranks, then keep it. If you're not, then get in. <laughs> See, my desire is that you march along with us. And we are not going to be able to go from this to whatever God has planned for us in the future unless we're disciplined and we're all of the same mind and of the same heart and of the same person and of the same goal to anoint the king. Keep rank. Amen. 